Okay. Okay, excellent. So um, everything is running. Hey, welcome guys. Thank you for joining me here at the Boyle Heights History Studios. We have a very um, special workshop that we're doing today. We're going to be planning for a Safar the cast over um, amidst the COVID-19 crisis. And, um, you know, normally it's hard enough to, uh, to really plan for the Passover holiday as it is. Um, it can often be, um, you know, really, really difficult all on its own to be able to, um, you know, just shop for all the things that are necessary, um, you know, that are necessary for the, the, the Passover holiday um, without us having a, um, you know, without us having a, a crisis, without us having runs on the market for these types of things. And um, actually, um, you know, that was what got me thinking, you know, how can I offer advice in order to make it easier for people um, during the Passover holiday for them to be able to um, get the food that they need in order to have a, a kosher, um, a, a healthy, and um, an enjoyable um, Passover dinner. And um, so um, what, what we're going, and um, for our meals throughout the entire week, throughout the entire week of, um, of the Passover holiday. And um, so what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be offering advice um, as a buyer's guide so that we can um, hopefully um, save you some time and save you some money in shopping and um, being able to prepare for your Passover holiday. And um, what's unique about this workshop is, is that we're going to be talking about foods for uh, the Passover holiday according to the Sephardic tradition. And um, that's um, really one of the, the things that people always ask me every year. Um, they ask my advice about um, how to plan for um, the Passover holiday in the Sephardic tradition. And um, so I've been doing, um, you know, some writings and workshops over the past few years um, when it comes to um, planning for the Passover holiday. And it's never been harder. It's never been harder um, than it is now for Sephardic Jews in this country because of um, so many um, unique complications about food in this country, which we never had to experience um, in the old world. We never had to experience, we never experienced in the Middle East and Spain or Mexico and stuff like that. Um, new developments in food processing, um, in enrichment and on chemical process, processing and all of this has really changed the game um, in a lot of ways and um, has really, believe it or not, made it harder. It has never been harder than it is today to be able to um, keep um, Passover in um, the Sephardic tradition. So I really want to be able to offer um, as much advice as I can in order to make it easier for people um, and um, so that they know what to look out for and um, what, what food products are probably best to choose during the Passover season in order to make um, you know, um, your cleaning process just easier. And um, one of the things that I also want to you know, keep in mind is that um, a lot of people who ask me for advice on planning for on the Passover holiday, I'm um, in the Sephardic tradition are um, families that um, either, you know, are mixed Ashkenazi, mixed, you know, um, Central Eastern European Jewish and mixed, you know, um, Sephardic Jewish, um, or people that are of the Ashkenazi tradition who um, are taking on the eating of kitniot, eat, taking on the eating of legumes and um, these things that are common to the Sephardic tradition, um, you know, taking them on in the um, Ashkenazi tradition because, um, and I don't want to go too much into this discussion, but um, it, it really comes down to that for Ashkenazi Jews, um, they, um, they were not accustomed to a lot of the different types of foods that, um, you know, are, are generally part of this, the, the staple diet of, um, of the Middle East and the New Worlds that are common to Sephardic Jews. And um, they didn't know really where certain um, foods played within um, you know, whether or not they are, are, are chametz or not. Well, I, I should probably at least explain that. What is chametz? Um, when, when we talk about chametz, we're talking about, um, we're talking about, um, we're not, we're talking about um, removing from our home. When we say removing leavening from our home, we're not talking about getting rid of the, the Fleischmann's yeast. <laughs> where that's, a, that's, that's not traditionally, you know, how um, fermentation and, and bread making and stuff like that's done. For those of you who know bread making and they're of the old school tradition, you know, it's usually done with the starter batch. Um, you left a little bit of, um, a, a little bit of flour in with um, some sugar and some peas and it would 
begin to um, rise on all its own. And that starter batch would, you know, um, give rise to um, your bread. And um, so that it, what we what we're keeping in mind is that any um, when we're when we're trying to remove Kamets, we're trying to remove the grains, um, the five grains, um, wheat, bart, oli, um, wheat, bart, oat, um, um, spelt. Um, we're, we're trying to remove, um, um, there's, 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 there's one I'm forgetting the top of my head right now. Um, anyhow, um, there's, there's five grains, I mean, traditional grains that, 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 um, that, that you know, we, we generally eat. These are our common things, wheat, oat, barley, um, um, rye, and spelt. There it is. And, um, you know, of these, if you add water to them, within 18 minutes of leaving it there, it will start to break down within the chemical process in itself, and it will start to um, ferment. It will start to self-leaven itself. And so we want to remove any of those things which um, will become self-leavened. And so the thing is, is that um, there are certain um, items that um, people didn't know, Ashkenazi Jews didn't know when they encountered them, whether these items become leavened when you add water to them. Will they rise on their own? And not knowing the answer to this question or where or kind of how they were grown and derived, if they were grown side by side, you know, next to Hametz or something like this, what they did is that they made a ruling that um, they should not eat these items, that they just don't eat them. And um, the reasoning for that is because we are not of this tradition. We do not know how to process them correctly. I mean, in order for them to be appropriate for us to eat. And um, why is it permissible for, you know, um, Sephardic Jews such as myself, um, Jews from the Middle East, from the, um, you know, from um, you know, Spain, Portugal, throughout the Americas, because these are our common staples. We, we, we grow them, we process them regularly as part of um, our native culture, and therefore, um, you know, we, you know, know from where they're derived and, and um, you know, whether or not they're habits or not. And so, um, given that knowledge, that we have that knowledge, we're able to distinguish um, that. And so, that's the thing is, is that um, one of the most important things for me to hand down is that um, within um, the Sephardic tradition, the reason why we are able to eat these items is because According to the rabbis, um, it is already built into our culture, our daily practice, how we should, how we should um, you know, check these and, um, and process them in order to be appropriate for, um, for Passover. And um, so let me, give you, let, let me give you an example for that. Um, for those of you that are of the old school um, tradition who are used to making your own, you know, arroz and tijol, um, and, uh, um, you know, in the old days, most of us, when we bought, when we went to the store and everything, when we bought uh, beans and rice, um, it, you know, oftentimes um, you would have to, most often what we would do is that we would have to take it home and we would have to clean our beans and rice. Uh, we would have to clean it before we would cook it. And um, what do I mean by cleaning it? And, and it, it's funny because every time I say that, um, I, you know, um, you know, a lot of Anglos are like, what do you mean by cleaning? And, and it's only the grandparents that, 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 that seem to, you know, um, you know point out that, um, you know, when you, you know, traditionally when we buy, um, you know, dry items such as beans, what you would traditionally find in them um, is um, waste from the field. You could find um, waste from the field. You'd find, um, you know, some, some rocks. You would find some, um, you know, sometimes even some other grains. Um, some other grains from um, other harvests. Some, many times you reuse fields for different types of, um, for different types of growth at different seasons. So what happens, or sometimes you would grow, um, say your beans and wheat side by side, milpa style. You would have mixed sharing. And what happens is that you would end up getting certain growth or certain things from these other things. And you don't want those in, in, in your beans. You don't, you don't want that in your rice. And so um, what the tradition, those of you who probably remember, and I remember this, this is, you know, the family tradition that, you know, we would keep is, um, you know, me and my family, we would sit down you know, with uh, grandma and grandpa. Move, well, not over there, not, not those rice, because those are hametz. And uh, why is that rice hametz? We'll talk about that next. Uh, how can the rice be hametz? Um, how is that possible? We'll talk about that. 
um, and just as such. Let's start with the beans. Um, you know, for, for, for those of you who are of the old school tradition, you know, what, what you will probably remember is, uh, you know, spending plenty of time um, with um, grandma and grandpa and your parents. And this is the Sephardic tradition um, before, you know, Passover, that what we would do is we'd get, you know, an off-colored sheet um, or a towel or whatever, and you put your, you know, beans out and you lay them all out so that you can pick from them if there was any type of um, waste in it, if there was bugs, if there was um, some, you know, oats from the field, if there um, was rocks, especially for rocks. If there was a rock that was not got from the beans, my grandpa would always get it. And um, he would always be the one to, to bite down on it. And I can see his disapproving face even now <laughs> as I think about it. Um, but you know, I remember, um, you know, back at my, you know, my grandparents' house, um, you know, it's a big family and everything. We make these big old pots of, of, of fiol. And so um, all of us would put our hands in and, and counting, um, I mean, not counting, but, but cleaning the beans and uh, removing waste from them. But what we do is, is that during the, 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 uh, during the Passover holiday, what we do is we take a lot more care within it when we actually do it. And um, so what we do is, is that we actually really are required, if we're going to eat beans, on um, dry beans and stuff like this coming from the fields, what we need to do is before we eat them, we are required to um, spread out all the beans and clean them, separating each bean one by one, <laughs> checking each bean, separating each bean at a time, um, bringing it in, not just whole swaths and, you know, going like we normally do, but Bean by bean, we go through in order to make sure that we are not, um, or that, that there's, there's uh, no comments in it. This is the Sephardic checking process. Um, this, is, this is exactly the same as going with the, um, you know, with the, the little feather going around to see if there's, there's uh, crumbs around. This, in the Sephardic tradition, is, is what we do. And um, Especially if you're going to be serving this for the, um, the, the, the Passover Seder, um, in some communities you want to check your beans like three times um, because you, know, you, you might have guests over, you know, your family members, um, you know, rabbis, whoever, and God forbid that you're embarrassed with you know, some type of hummets or something dirty being inside um, your beans. So we check our beans and um, we, we, we go through you know, that whole process. And, uh, but you have, to check, um, you have to check each bean <laughs> going one from another. It is tedious and it actually is tedious. It is an effort. Um, and so it's really funny because one of the things that, that people often you know, tell, oh, you're so far as Jewish and you can eat beans and rice and uh, um, you know, it's so easy for you. And um, you know, one, one of the important things to keep in mind is that um, there are certain things that are common in all Jewish traditions. Number one, during the Passover holiday, we generally go back to raw for everything and, 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 and how we're creating um, you know, our items. We're, we're, the food that we're creating, we're mostly um, producing from raw in order for us to be able to make sure that it does not have um, any comments, any additives, any um, extra fillers or anything that we uh, don't want. So we produce, you know, pretty much everything from scratch. Those things that we do not um, make from scratch um, are required to have a kosher for Passover, um, um, you know, on seal on them. They are required to have pishtacha, that it is kosher for Passover. Um, and that is important to know, just because people, if you are of the Sephardic tradition, you, that does not mean that you can go and you can pick up a can of beans, um, sun the beans or something off of, off of the shelf. No, um, you really can't do that. And, and there's, there's, there's good reasons why not to do that, because um, whereas the main product might be good, the additives in it um, are often comments. They're, they're, they're often something that is of a comet's um, derivative that you don't want. So it, it's not different um, from the Ashkenazi to the Sephardic tradition. Generally, everything we make from scratch, those that are not um, created from scratch, we require to have a, um, a kosher for Passover um, symbol on it. And um, we have our kosher for Passover. This is an OUP. The P does not stand for par, 
Um, it actually stands for, in this case, for um, Passover. It's U-C-O-U-P. That does not mean parv. In this case, it happens to be parv. But O-U-P means that it is kosher for Passover. So that is the symbol that you want to look for. Um, that is extremely important. Um, because um, especially when it comes to selecting items like this, um, you know, this isn't of the Sephardic tradition. This is Ashkenazi matzah ball soup. But um, a lot of these items that we have that are created for um, Jewish markets, um, you know, for Jewish consumers, they produce them for all year round. People eat matzah ball soup, they eat matzahs, and, you know, um, all of these different types of things all year round. So they do have regular all year round stuff that is not kosher for Passover. Um, it's only kosher for Passover if they're using matzah meal in it, not just flour, but they're using matzah meal. They're using um, ground-up matzahs that have already been tempered. Pretty much they've been baked away. So now they, once you've baked the matzahs, you can pretty much use it for whatever you want because it's not going to become hummus after that point. And so that's what you're going to get with, um, within the Passover versions is that you're going to get um, ones that are made entirely with, um, actual, um, with actual kosher for Passover matzah meal that is used as opposed to flowers and many of these things. And so that's important to note. You want to make sure that it has a kosher for a Passover symbol if you're going to buy um, any of these items because um, they, they'll, they'll look exactly the same. And, um, and so that's not very important for us to know. That is the symbol. Um, but that's, that's important for me to note. You cannot just go out and buy um, you know, on just any product that, that um, because you're the Sephardic tradition, you're, oh, that's beans, that's, that's, that's rice. Um, actually, it's very problematic, um, especially when you're buying, when you're um, trying to eat these items and they're added as part of a, uh, as, as part of a processed food. And so that brings us to rice. Let me give you an example of how hard it is in America to keep in, in uh, the Sephardic tradition. And, um, you know, one of the interesting main staples for um, Sephardic Jews, for especially of the Middle Eastern tradition in the Passover holiday, um, is to have rice, you know, is to have rice for the Passover holiday, which um, is something that Ashkenazi Jews um, don't, um, you know, don't generally permit. And um, so, but it is really one of the main staples um, for um, most Sephardic communities, not all Sephardic communities, uh, there are some um, Sephardic communities, such as the Moroccan communities. Many Moroccan communities do not eat rice um, during the Passover holiday. Why don't they do it during the Passover holiday? Um, because with rice, you have to do exactly what you do with beans. You have to separate each grain from, from each other. That means you have to go grain by grain, making sure that the rice um, does not have hummus in it. And um, that's tedious. And because some people really won't put the effort in, They'll just fudge it. People know this over time that, you know, them and their kids would just fudge it. And um, some people just thought, so other communities just thought it was too much effort. So they decided that they just weren't going to have rice. So there are uh, whole Moroccan communities that don't have rice um, during the Passover holiday. Whereas on, in Persian communities, you will actually have rice um, with a beet on top of the, the Seder plate in, in, in uh, some in some families, instead of having a shank bone as part of the, the meal, um, the, the karban, what they do is they put rice. But the problem is in this country is that rice um, creates for us the biggest problem um, for, um, for Passover. And um, specifically because of the way that we overprocess our rice. How could it be that um, rice could become chametz? And I say that is because I picked these up. I picked up these bags of rice on the um, on the, the the one of the first days that there was a run on the market, and I was really freaked out because um, one of the first things I noticed was that on um, the beans and the rice had all been bought out. They, there, there was no beans and rice in the general aisles. So I had to go hunting um, through the the ethnic sections and not just on the regular aisles, and I was able to in the back rows um, of the ethnic sections get you know able to find some rice. And um, when I looked over them, what the first thing that I noticed is that 
Um, of these, you know, three bags that I have here, only one of them can I actually eat for Passover. And what, why is it that? It's because these two right here are hummets. And, and, and why is it that these are hummets? Well, if you look at the ingredients on these, what you'll notice is that it says, ingredient, long grain rice. It doesn't end there. It says, enriched with iron, uh, uh, ferric, atrophosphate, niacin, thiamine, and folic acid. And um, it, it says the same thing on here. And um, so what you'll notice about this rice is that um, this is Goya, this is El Mexicano. And um, these rice, this rice here has been um, enriched. It's been fortified, it's been enriched. And um, why is it enriched? Um, believe it or not, the enrichment in this only adds a, a trace element of, of nutrients to it. I mean, it's, it's um, negligible. Um, you know, it, it, it's really not much at all. So why do they actually add um, the, um, you know, the, these, um, you know, these additives to it? It's in order to, um, it's in order to, to add shelf life to it. The, this rice, because um, in order to get it as white as we like and everything, what they did is they overprocessed it. Um, they they soaked it. They they parboiled it. They took the you know the um, they took the 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 uh, you know the bran off of it. They polished it, and you got this nice little pieces of white starch here. And you have these nice little lovely pieces of white starch. And um, but what happens is that um, because you've taken out all the nutrients and the protective coating of this, this is now more subject to, corrupt, to, to, to corruptibility. It's more subject to, um, to, to spoilage. And so what happens is that they've added nutrients back into it in order to add shelf stability to it. And so for it to last longer. And so um, that is you know, important you know, for us to, uh, you know, to note within that is that um, we, we have right here these rices that people, you know, if you go and you look in the store and everything, um, you know, you would think that, you know, this is just, you know, ordinary rice, if, especially if you come from other countries. If you come from Mexico, if you come from the Middle East, um, the idea of having additives added to rice just seems strange. As a matter of fact, the instructions on it, on this rice also tell you that because of the additives, you should not, um, that you should not rinse it. Hey there, hey there, Marie. Um, so yeah, it tells you not to rinse it. Don't rinse it because we've added nutrients to it, which is really kind of interesting because those of you, again, who are the old school ethic tradition, traditionally what we do is uh, we, we rinse our rice. We rinse it until it's clear to get all the starch off of it. And, um, but they don't want us to do that in order for it to, you know, keep its nutritional value that it has on this. And um, believe it or not, um, this is the problem for why 100% of rice that is created, that is, that is grown and produced in the United States on this subject is, is, um, is suspect of being comments because the additives that we have in here, we don't know from where they're derived in this country. Uh, most often where we derive these types of nutrients are from other grain products. So what we have within these is that if you look at this rice, you look at the bag, you'll notice that there's this white powder that's not just coating the rice, but it's coating the bag. This is actually like a flour that is added into it. And um, so you, 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 you have, um, you know, these, these things that are most likely hummets, um, that have been added to the rice. And this is the law in the country. It's section seven of the, uh, of the US code uh, for agriculture that, that you must add these to it. And uh, one of the also reasons that it gives in one of the sub subsections for adding is that there used to be scurvy uh, you know, in this country and um, you know, stuff like that because they would over process um, wheat and, and rice and everything on corn and everything that it, it would have no nutritional value left at the end. And um, so um, it's required. So that's rather, you know, so, is, so, so what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do if we want to eat rice for the Passover holiday? I have some great advice. Um, you know, um, what you should do is you should, um, you should go to the ethnic markets and you'll probably find that will be your best bet. The rice that is probably gonna be best is, is going to be pure basmati, pure basmati rice, 
um, without any um, additives or preservatives, without any enrichment. Um, basmati rice is probably going to be your best bet. Um, some of the other ones are non-enriched calorose rice. Don't buy um, um, generic calorose style, but the actual brand calorose without additives, um, you might be able to go with, um, with that as well. Um, this one I found, um, this one I found at Food for Less right here on First Street. And it was the last rice in the, um, in the Asian section. And what's interesting, how did this get into the market? Well, they put a big old uh, sticker over it um, and uh, they covered up what the ingredients were. And so I had to peel underneath. And if you peel underneath, what it says is organic Thai jasmine rice. And uh, yeah, you can see that there has been no enrichment or anything added to this. And again, um, you know, uh, we don't, especially Asians don't want this enrichment, you know, added to it. Those of us that are of the Middle Eastern traditions as well don't want to add it because it makes the rice mushy. And um, so um, this, you know, um, organic Thai jasmine rice without additives is also um, really, really a, um, a great bet within that. And that's, that's very important for me to know. And um, I say that is because, um, you know, what the, the issue of Kitneo, I, I, I really want to take it on because we really have to, you know, right now, as there are runs on the markets and we're having a hard time trying to um, feed our families, um, you know, we really need to um, think in, in, in terms of how we can, um, um, you know, not just most economically and, and um, you know, easiest, you know, get food, you know, essential food items that we need. I mean, I went to Galson. They didn't instill, they still didn't have beans, um, you know, on the market. I was at Galson today. They didn't have beans. Um, but, um, you know, it's right now, um, I'm trying to, you know, in presenting the Sephardic traditions, I'm also trying to, you know, help us understand what the traditions are for eating kitniyot so that these are also options um, if we are able to find them within, you know, our local markets um, for us to be able to fortify our diets. And I think a lot of people who've been on the fence, um, who um, have been wanting to um, keep the tradition of eating kidney oil, because it is a tradition, as you see, having to clean it and check all of these things. It is an active tradition. It is a masora. It is a handed down tradition. It's not just the absence of a prohibition um, against the ban of kidney oil that Ashkenazi we have. No, we have an active tradition within it. And for those who have been wanting to keep the active tradition of um, keeping kosher for Passover in the Sephardic style. I think this is really um, a good time to go for it. Uh, this is a really good time to learn, especially as we, um, you know, there's just, it's just so limiting. Um, adding things like corn and green beans uh, and these types of things to your diet, I think will really be able to help fortify your diet. And, um, you know, re in recent years, there has been a move by the conservative movement in Israel and, um, I'm not sure how far it's gone within the United States yet, but um, with um, progressive Jewish movements starting to embrace um, the idea of people taking on the tradition of eating kitniya as kosher for Passover. And, um, you know, the, the conservative movement, you know, um, did um, not quite a response, but they did kind of a recommendation within, you know, their, their, their rulings, I think a couple of years ago, their Passover guide that, um, you know, about embracing the, the tradition of, of eating kidney oil. The problem with this, and, and I, I love, I love that finally we're getting to the point of opening it because, you know, the, tr the, the truth is, is that even in Eastern Europe, people know, you know, people know what, a, what you, 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 you know, what beans and rice and whether or not they're hamets or not. They know after all these hundreds of years. I mean, that's not. That's that, 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 that issue is, 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 is uh, you know, already settled and stuff like that. Um, but the, the issue of um, within the Jewish tradition is that we don't, um, you know, we don't try to um, snub the, the, the tradition of our, of our ancestors. We try to keep the tradition that our ancestors, you know, kept. Um, but the thing is, is that there's, um, you know, it's been hundreds of years that some people have been on the fence about this. And now um, the progressive Jewish movements have started to move forward. No, I mean, it, it, it should be acceptable. Um, especially considering that a lot of Jewish families, um, over half of the Jewish world, both in Israel and outside of Israel, is half Ashkenazi, half Sephardi. So um, it, it, it is important that we, we do uh, make sure that we you know, embrace these traditions. The only, 
sad thing about the way that the conservative movement kind of rolled out the discussion with them that is that they uh, started giving recommendations that people can start keeping, you know, um, the tradition of, you know, that they want to, you know, eating rice and beans. But it was, you could tell it was written by a bunch of Ashkenazi rabbis who had no familiarity with, with the actual tradition of eating, you know, because they offered no advice. They offered absolutely no advice. They, you know, say that yeah, now it's permissible, you know, to eat, you know, rice and beans. Well, then tell you that if you pick up any rice in, in, this, in this country, it's made in this country. If you pick up Uncle Ben's, if you pick up Mahatma, if you pick up a Mexicano, if you pick up Goya, you know, you're going to get, um, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're going to get, you know, um, uh, Hamed, uh, most likely in with it. And, and um, so that's very problematic. The other thing is, is that um, a lot of people got the wrong idea. Um, they, 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 um, you know, they got the idea that there's, you know, this ban lifted and therefore we're able to eat whatever we want. And so um, literally I was seeing, um, you know, some, some people who, um, were, 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 you know, um, you know, stocking up on a bunch of things that weren't kosher for Passover, uh, like Sabra hummus, like the whole refrigerator full of Sabra hummus. And people asked this, this person who's a rabbinic student, you know, are you, um, you know, is that kosher for Passover? They said, oh, well, the, the conservative movement said that, you know, I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Nothing's changed. It's still the same for, for Safari. Does it doesn't have a kosher for Passover symbol on it? You know? And you're not going to find a kosher for Passover symbol on that product ever um, because you know, they, they, they just don't make that as a kosher for Passover product. Um, and you know, and you know, I had to kind of break it down. You know, one of the big problems in it is not the chickpeas. The problem is the additives. Like, let me give you an example. What is the biggest problem with that Sabra hummus? Um, like a lot of products, what, we, what, what you're going to find in certain, there are certain additives that, um, that would surprise you, their origin, such as citric acid. Now, you would think that it comes from lemons or for something like that or for some type of fruit. No, 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 no. In this country, because we grow so much grain, you can, grow, you know, you can create citric acid artificially you know, within a petri dish. And so that's what they do. They use, um, you can use wheat and corn. Um, and um, in order to you know, produce citric acid. So in this country, that's mostly what we do, um, is we do it the artificial method. Same with, with, um, with, with vinegar. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, most often, you know, use of grain, either corn or wheat. Uh, especially if you, you live in the Northeast or if you're, you're in Canada, um, or if you're buying stuff that's imported from England, it's, it's, it's in the Anglo tradition, it's very common um, for them to use wheat. I mean, there's just so much of it that we grow um, that um, it's, it's used um, as, as one of the sources for being able to. The problem is, is that um, those, are, those additives are, you know, can be literal or they can be literal, um, you, you know, uh, you know, comets. And um, um, citric acid, like um, it, oftentimes what they will make it out of is um, waste from brewers brewery waste, what's left over, you know, from it and stuff like that. And um, there's also all kinds of, you, you know, there's also other kinds of things where people can go wrong because we just don't know um, what the, the, you know, the items are. Um, like, um, let me give you an example. There are certain, there are certain chemicals that you'll find as regular ingredients within foods, but many of us don't know where they come from. And um, many of them do actually come from grains. They're actually hummets. Um, and um, very many times in this, in, in this country. So let me give you an example. Um, the, the rabbis um, from um, Kashrut.com give us this list of, um, of additives that most often come from hummets. Alcohol, absorbic acid, citric acid, dextrose, glucose, malodextrin, um, polyphosphate, sodium citrate, um, um, sodium, ethrobate, xanthan glum, sorbitol. So what's really kind of interesting is, is that when you look at a lot of these items, what it doesn't seem apparent to people is that some of these items might be created by someone putting this grain in there with this enzyme that creates this chemical reaction, then they put some um, sulfuric acid to burn off this from it, and then you get, you know, this, and, and so you have all of these processes and everything, but a lot of, a lot of these 
um, they are chametz, and they're a spe it, it becomes a more complicated during Passover because normally we allow certain things like sometimes like one in ten mixtures. On Passover, it's like one in sixty. We we are very very scrupulous. So the, it's very very tight when it really comes down to it. Um, you know, there's so many additives in the United States that come into our products that are, um, that, that are processed foods that we really need to stay away from them unless they have kosher for Passover symbols, in which people are going out of their way in order to produce something that, um, you know, is, is fitting um, for the holiday. And so that is important, you know, for us to know. But it is important for us, again, to keep in mind that keeping the tradition of Kitniyot is, is, um, is a tradition. It is not the absence of a prohibition. It's, you know, um, Sephardic Jews don't live in a, in, in a, um, in a uh, um, Wild West free for all. And, and I say this, that's very important because, um, you know, a lot of people are taking the thing of, well, I'm going Sephardic. And that kind of reminds me. Um, that's kind of obnoxious because it reminds me a lot of how um, people say, um, you know, um, um, you know, when someone is pointing out, you know, ask, you know, someone about, you know, whether they're observant or not, you know, they say, oh, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm reformed. Well, there is an observance about being a reformed Jew. A reformed Jew doesn't mean not, you know, to uh, not have strict rules or something like that. Reformed Judaism has its own active tradition, its own values, its own customs, and stuff like that. So, too, with the Sephardic tradition, um, Sephardic tradition isn't just the absence of, of a prohibition of keeping up. We have an active tradition, um, you know, that we keep, and it's important um, to do that. But like I said, it's never been harder. Believe it or not, in the old days, it used to be easy for buying Mexican rice because they just didn't bother um, with, with um, putting the enrichment into these items. Um, especially the, the two ones that you sh normally used to go for was Goya, and the other one's even more funnier, uh, Padron, Pharaoh, and uh, it's a big old Pharaoh, you know, um, it had a sphinx on it, and, um, and, um, but they, you know, small batches from Mexican markets for the kind of city as at the end caps and stuff like that, but now that as Latinos um, and Asians are starting to spread out across the country in large numbers, and um, be really, um, um, really good markets, um, you know, to, to produce items for. What happens is that they're having to arise to, um, you know, all of the, um, the, the, the laws of the United States in order to get their product in the stores. And so um, it's changed, you know, it's changed a lot more in recent years. And so it is important, again, for us to check on when it comes to these items. So rice is the problem, but for beans and stuff like this, no problem. We just need to make sure to, um, you know, to check them before the holiday, and that is important. Um, if we are going to get rice and beans and all of these things for the holidays, it is, um, it, you know, holistically, we do have to purchase them before the holiday, um, especially considering that we want to include them when we say the blessing in which we are nullifying the hamet but it becomes like dust of the earth and everything. When we do that nullification, we want that to be included at that time. Um, so um, you do, for any of these um, dry items that you're going to buy for the Passover holiday, you want to make sure that you buy them actually before the holiday, that you check them before the holiday, and that you have them in mind when you say, um, you know, the blessing for the nullification of Hametz. And um, so um, that is um, rather important for me to note within that. And I'm trying to think right now if there's anything else. When it comes to other type of legumes, though, and we're talking about, um, it, we're talking about things such as green beans, we're talking about things such as corn um, that you're going to be picking up um, you know, at the store, you can get just fresh raw right off of, you know, the stacks in the produce section. If you are buying, um, if, if, if you are buying um, frozen vegetables, that is fine as well. The only thing about frozen vegetables is you have to make sure uh, that they do not have any flavor additives. Um, you don't want the ones with the little Asian noodles in them that come at, you don't want and with any type of flavors or anything. They have to be plain, and that, that really is the thing. In order to make sure to get whatever items that you want, make sure that there are no um, extra flavors that are added to that. If you're buying quinoa, quinoa, that's not, you know, that, that can never become a comment. It, it's a key, it never becomes a comment. 
Where does the hamet come in? When they add some of the flavorings in some of these packets that they make of, um, uh, of, of uh, you know, designer, you know, little packets that they make. And so um, you, you, you really want to go for the stuff that has the least additives, the least processing. And that's really, I, I think that's really great. We're given one time a year in which we um, really go back and we live like our family has for time immemorial, handing down our family know-how, handing down our family traditions, our recipes, and all of that. And um, so it, it's, um, you know, I think that's really, it, it's really a beautiful, um, it's a really beautiful time for us to get in contact with both our food and our, and, and our roots. Um, and, uh, um, you know, the food really takes center stage within this holiday. Not that it doesn't at the rest of the holiday, but especially at this holiday. And, um, but this gives us an opportunity for us to really, um, you know, understand from, from um, you know, where our, our, you know, our food comes from. Because unless you grew up on a farm, a lot of you don't know, um, you know, why certain things are. Like, a lot of people don't know that why we have watched grain. Um, when we make the matzahs is because it's very common that when you produce grains that you soak them in water in order to get husks off of them and then you use hot air in order to dry them and stuff like this. And, um, you know, we, we, during the Passover season, we don't do any of those things. We, we, it's just straight grain. It's very, very organic. Uh, we just use straight grain uh, that, that has been dried, ground down as it is uh, with no salt or anything. And those are matzahs. You know, you know, just straight organic, straight from the earth, and um, it, it's it's um, you know, it starts at there, and we move on um, throughout the rest of our diet of getting in contact with um, with our food in ways that we very rarely do. Um, but um, you know, I hope that you know we move out of this holiday, also keeping in mind some of the um, ideas of how to get some of those unnecessary additives. Um, out of um, our diet. But if you're buying frozen vegetables, they're totally fine um, as long as you buy, again, buy them before the holiday and stuff like that. Um, I did go to Gelson's. I, I did go to Gelson's today in order to pick up um, stuff for the Passover holiday. So I do have a bunch of food. My mom is, is actually um, the food safety manager for Gelson's Markets. And um, so she also does the training for like the service galleys and everything. And um, you know, I worked for Galsons. All my family worked for Galsons over the years. We, we um, were all um, grocery workers, Union 770, um, United Food and Commercial Workers. And um, my mom, um, you know, now works for Galsons Corporate, and she does the training um, for food services and stuff like that. And um, you know, for years, what they would do is that when people were trying to market stuff to Galsons, you know, for the Jewish section for Middle Eastern food, they would send it with her. And uh, if I liked it, uh, they would buy it. If I wouldn't eat it, they knew no one would. <laughs> and so they wouldn't invest. Um, but so I, I get all kinds of great things that they send my way sometimes, you know, keeping me in mind. But I actually made a run myself in order to buy things because um, I'm separated from my family because of the quarantine right now. I'm going to be joining them you know, through um, Zoom with, um, with our, our, our Seder. Um, but I did go to pick up everything at the Galsons um, in the Hyperion store. And so I was able to pick up all kinds of really wonderful things. And um, so I'll show you some of the things that I got. But um, ah, we have on the fruit slices. I got a few of these. I know the kid in you is probably jumping. You're, you're thinking of your childhood right here. And, um, oh, these are the, the, uh, the, you know, normally we don't have marshmallows. Um, it, they're hard to find year round because of being made out of gelatin, but these are made out of kosher gelatin, out of fish bone gelatin and, um, vegetable. And so these are, um, these are our marshmallows, and I think they're 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 like yeah, coated in coconut and stuff like that. I love coconut, but um, I, excuse me, I decided that for on um, on the macaroon, I was gonna go with almond. I love the almonds, so I picked up all kinds of things. We got um, we got macaroons, but I got potato starch, matzo meal. Um, your know, matzo meal is what we use in place of of um. You know, in place of flour, 
Um, again, this has already, you know, been um, baked and tempered, you know, and then ground back down again. So you can use this just like you do breadcrumbs or, um, or you know, without any worry about it um, becoming comets. Although there are some traditions where people don't eat on Gebrooks. That's a whole nother thing. I don't want to go down that whole point on it. it, it that's a whole nother, that's, um, you know, that, that's a whole nother path to go, um, to go down. But one of the other things that you can use also um, in place of um, flour and um, for thickening things is potato starch. And um, so um, we have some potato starch here. Um, potato, potato latka mix. And um, yeah, we have our matzo ball soup mix over here. I was able to find some kosher for Passover, um, you know, chicken bouillon. And um, these are really good, adding a little bit of extra flavor to things. Um, and of course, I got some wine. They, the the Gelson's markets have great selections of kosher wines. I'm a Merlot fan. And um, you know, for, for the Passover holiday, you know, we have four cups of wine. And what we're talking about is um, each person basically drinking a bottle of wine. <laughs> and a lot of wine. I'm probably going to have a little bit more than that because I'm leading the service and um, be more thrilling that way. And um, some horseradish chip. I'm not gonna use this. We actually don't use horseradish in the Sephardic tradition. We use romaine stalks as the bitter herb because this is sharp instead of bitter um, as we understand it. Um, but kosher salt, kosher salt is also very important. Kosher salt is, is very necessary because it also does not have any of those extra additives, um, nice iodine, these types of things, um, or extra sodiums that are derived from strange locations. And so that's very important. The kosher salt, uh, you know, we use it for, for um, you know, because of its texture and its grain for making, you know, meat kosher during the process. But it's also one of the best, um, the best salt to be able to use for cooking because it doesn't have any of those additives. Also, because of its grain, it sticks to your food in order to transmit the, you know, the flavor into the food without, you know, with, with, without easily coming off. It's a great way of seasoning your food. So you'll notice all the chefs really, really love using um, the, the, the coarse kosher salt. And, um, and um, of course, you know, one of the, you know, one of the things that um, I did pick up um, as well, again, another key meal item is, is, um, is on um, peanut butter and um, you know, peanuts. And um, so I got peanut butter, peanut butter. Now that's, you have to be very careful about. Um, peanut butter, because again, you could get all kinds of things that are added to it as fillers. Um, but what you, um, you know, just go to, just, just go to um, you know, one of the stores and buy 100% um, you know, um, you know, peanut butter, just you know, pure you know, um, peanut butter. And, um, you know, you can do that. You can, um, there are also, you know, and, um, you know, you can also, you know, make your uh, peanut butter just a little bit more creamy. Um, if you take your raw peanut butter and you add some, um, or just a little bit of salt and some honey to it and you mix it in, that's how you make it a little bit creamier and stuff like that. It's a great way of, um, of, of, of adding a little bit of protein into your, your diet as well with, with, with your matzo. But with that in mind about um, the dietary thing of matzo, I got, you know, a big thing of matzo, Yehuda matzas, and these are five pounds. And, um, you know, I never eat all of this. I, 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 I never eat all of this, um, but I did get it. Anyhow, and um, you know what's, what was strange is that when the run started in the market, I went to East LA to try to find matzahs, just regular all year round matzahs, not kosher for Passover. And I couldn't even find those because people were buying them out. And people were like, yeah, because you know, the, the, you know, these things will last forever. And the only thing that was kind of like left behind was the gefilte fish in the jar. Nobody wanted that. And, and so, um, but, but uh, all of the matzahs um, um, were gone and stuff like that. But um, one of the things I do want to point out, and this is a bit especially important while we're thinking about, um, you know, the COVID-19 crisis, one of the things 
Yeah, we're in quarantine um, in order to protect people that are infirm and, um, you know, have weak immune systems. I, I um, you know, have a weakened immune system. You know, I've, um, you know, my immune system has been, has been shot for 20 years. And so, you know, I'm, you know, in deep isolation because, you know, I, I really don't have much of an active immune system and stuff like that. And um, because of a lot of the medicines I take, you know, as well, um, you, you know, I, I, um, you know, I have a hard time eating and get a lot of nausea and stuff like that. And so, you know, keeping up my diet is really, really important. And that's one of the things I want to stress. It's important for all of us who have underlying health conditions um, that um, we take care of ourselves to keep our strength up as much as we can so that we're not susceptible, um, you know, more susceptible to this illness. It is important that we do keep up resting. We do keep up eating, um, you know, as best as we can. We're not overexerting ourselves. We're not, um, you know, we're, 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 you know, fortifying our body with, with enough food. And then one of the ways that we can also do this is that the Sephardic tradition um, is, is very practical when it comes to, um, you know, answering, you know, a lot of these questions in, in um, you know, giving um, possibilities for people, not just clamming up when there's a problem, but, but, but leaning into a problem and finding solutions. And, um, you know, it, this is an example of it. One, one of the things that we have in the Sephardic tradition that we allow is um, that we allow the eating of, um, uh, of, of um, matzah shifa, we allow rich matzah. And what we mean by that is, um, Egg matzahs and matzahs that, as, as you'll see in the corner, it says egg matzah right here. Well, what does it say right here in the corner? It says made with fruit juice. And um, what happens is, is that um, it, if you look over, well, let me, let me, yeah, I think you'll see it right here. And it says right here um, on it, in Hebrew and in English, according to the Ramo, the Rema, uh, the Madran, uh, um, and the, the Sephardic master of the, 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 the um, and, um, and, um, and um, the, the, uh, the Sephardic master's um, writings on, on, on the, 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 the Shulchan Aruch as, um, as, as interpreted by the, the commentators over there, they've given us certain handing down rulings that are now infamous about how we um, manage ourselves during Passover. And specifically, this is one of the, um, the most famous, you know, kind of, uh, you know, mechloket issues is, um, you know, in, in Spain and Portugal, what was allowed, um, and in, in, in throughout the Middle East, what was allowed is that for when, the, when matzahs were produced, um, they would allow people to add um, egg or fruit juices into them. Um, and, um, and so what happens is that you would thus have rich matzahs. They, they had, and the reason why they would do that is in order to add a little bit more flavor into it, to add a little bit more nutrient, um, nutrition into it. So it says on it, according to the Ramo, these matzot um, may be used in case of necessity by the sick and elderly, they cannot be used for the matzos mitzvah, for the matzos mitzvah at the Passover seder. So you can't use them during the Passover seder. Um, when Passover begins on Saturday night, they may be used at the evening and morning meals for the preceding Shabbat. Okay. So, but what what the let's roll back on this. Um, you're not allowed to use these for the mitzvah of the the, the Passover seder. Um, because um, that is a mitzvah all in of itself. The, the mitzvah is eating the matzah. And so, um, you know, that is, that is the, 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 the whole mitzvah right in there. So we don't do it during the, the, during the Seder. However, aside from that, d during the rest of the week, um, you know, it's often very hard to get people that are sick to want to eat. It's hard to, you know, get them to want to eat. So, what the, the allowance is, is that um, aside from the Seder, um, people that are elderly and uh, are weak of health are able to have these, um, these egg or, you know, and, you know, juice added matzot because they taste better as well. It's not that they add a whole lot more nutrients. They don't really add a whole lot more nutrients. 
Um, but but um, it does also make them a lot more um, delightful to the taste, which means that people are more likely to eat. So, um, but um, these are, um, it's generally, these are only allowed in the Ashkenazi tradition. The Rema only allows it for um, sick and infirm. In the Sephardic tradition, we allow it for anyone. Anyone is able to uh, make use of these. And um, I definitely, at this, at this season, while we have this, pl this plague going before us and everything, um, you know, we, we, I, I think this is really the best time for us to use that ruling of the Maran, um, that, that uh, the Sephardic master that allows it for us to be widely used. Um, we need to keep our nutrition up. And if this gets our kids to eat um, better, then um, I think it's the way that we should go. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I, I'm so excited about, um, I got two boxes of bees. So I have, I have a lot of matzah and, uh, and stuff right here, but um, yeah, you know, that, you know, really, you know, it's hard enough right now, you know, it's hard enough, um, you know, at this time of year in order to plan for the Passover holiday without having to have this whole crisis and everything going on without there being runs on the markets and everything. But um, hopefully, um, you know, we, we, you know, I'm able to show people with them, you know, um, both, um, you know, knowing what the kosher food options are that we have in the city that are available to us. It was, it, it was, although I should say, it was pretty hard to get into Galson today. It was sprinkling a bit. It took me about um, an, a little over an hour to get inside. And, um, and, um, yeah, yeah, but I was able to find, um, a lot of things over at the, um, over at the, the Silver Lake store. The only thing I wasn't able to find at the Hyperion store was the Unger's Gefelta fish loaves. I always buy the Unger's Gefelta fish loaves, um, because no one buys the stuff in the jar. I mean, that, 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 that stuff is, is scary. Uh, but I love, I mean, you know, what I, if you've ever come to my Shabbat events, what you'll know is, is that I, we, I, I often, um, for the kiddies as well, and for the amusement of the adults, what we do is we, we have fried gefilte fish. We take the, the, um, you know, the loaf and it, it's, 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 um, you know, basically it has the consistency of, you know, the, um, the dough, you know, before it's cooked, it has a consistency of, of, um, of like, you know, masa for tamal. So what we do is, you know, you fry it. You, know, you fry it up with little gorditas. And, you know, we call fish latkes. And um, that's how we get the kids to eat on um, gefilte fish. And um, yeah, of course, I like the sweet ones. I couldn't find any. So hopefully my mom will pick some up and send it on my way with my sister. Um, but um, yeah, it was kind of hard to get. I, I just wasn't going to the kosher markets. Um, usually I go to the Persian markets, but they're so packed. And I, you know, um, you know, there's so many people that I, I you know, it's just getting anxiety at the, the thought of it. Again, this is my immune system, but um, we are gonna be doing our Passover Seder here on Wednesday night, um, starting around 7.30. And, um, you know, we're going to be streaming it like this. Hopefully, this is the, um, you know, the, 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 you know, the way, um, you know, the way to, you know, to connect. Now, if anyone has any questions, um, this is probably a good time to throw it at. If anyone um, is on, 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 on Zoom, wants to, um, you know, ask a question either in voice or on camera, I can throw you on as well. This is only the second time I think I've used Zoom. Um, so I'm testing this out in order for us to be able to utilize it for our Passover Seder. And um, I think that this will be um, our way of, uh, you know, being able to, you know, stay connected is, um, you know, through this method. But, um, yeah, you know, one of the, I'm going to point you, though, to some resources. And um, one of the most important things that, you know, for us to keep in mind, oh, 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 before I go any further. One of the important things to keep in mind as well, and I know that, that, that this is going to come up and, and, and it always happens, again, because I have Gelson's on the mind. One of the things that happens after Passover is, is that I get tons of care packages that the stores send me of a bunch of gluten-free products. And why do I get tons of gluten-free products that are given to me after Passover? 
It's because there are a bunch of hipsters that walk into a Galton store and buy a bunch of items of processed foods that say gluten-free on it. And so they take them to their rabbi and they argue with them for a few days. They argue with their rabbis that it says gluten-free and that, so, so that means that it's comets free. And the rabbi will say, no, 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 no. And they'll point on it. You know, either there's oats in it <laughs> um, or there's, you know, or it's one of these derivative chemicals from a comets chemical process and stuff like this. And they'll point to it. And what happens or there's some type of noodles made out of something. There's certain things that we just don't um, grind down and make and take like form because it might, you know, it, it's too confusing to people. And so there's all these different types of traditions. Um, and, but, for the, but still, it, it's still the case that, you know, you don't, you don't utilize, pro, you know, um, on, you, you know ma over manufacture, you know, pro, um, uh, um, these, these, um, these products that are, that, that, that are processed. We don't utilize them without a kosher for Passover symbol, you know, even if they are a PEO, then they say that they are um, gluten free and stuff like that, because they could have, they could, you can totally have, um, um, grain and something without it, 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 it having gluten. And, um, you know, for those people who have grain allergies, they'll, they'll confirm on this. Yes, it's absolutely true. You can actually separate some of the, the gluten from, you know, some of the grains and some grains just don't have it at all naturally and stuff like that. So, um, you know, the, believe it or not, the, the, the gluten-free does not help as much as you would think it, w it would when it comes to Passover. So what happens is that these guys, you know, will bring all of this to show their rabbi and will fight with them. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll fight with their, their, you know, Sephardic Mizrahi rabbis and, and uh, they say, no, 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 you can't. So what happens is that they'll lock it up, they'll sell it with their, their chametz, and then they'll come and they'll return it to Gelson's afterwards. <laughs> and the containers aren't in the greatest condition, so they, you know, they send them as care packages to me. Um, but that's really important. No, no, gluten-free does not mean that it's chametz free. And so that is important for us to know within that we still need to go through the process of, of, of checking to make sure that it doesn't have one of those um, five grains in it. Again, um, um, you know, wheat, um, you know, wheat, barley, oat, rye, spelt, you know, we, those, those types of things. We, you know, we want to make sure that we do not have those. Um, you know, during this time of year. Now, there are certain resources that you can turn to um, for um, advice on, on, on preparing for Passover. Traditionally, you know, you turn to your rabbis of the area. And why do you turn to your rabbis? Because they're securing the food for themselves all year round as, as, as a kosher consumer. And sometimes they get jobs supervising stuff. So they know what comes in the products. They know the offerings of their area. So count on your rabbi. If there's a question, Call upon your rabbi or, or call upon someone of the tradition, you know, that, that, that can help steer you in the way. And if you have any questions, you know, I'll, I'll try to help as much as I can, um, you, know, for, uh, um, you know, to find the products that we need in the area. But if you have, you know, don't assume. If you have questions, ask. And there are resources that you can turn to. Um, you know, most people, of course, turn to the Orthodox Union. They have some great resources that they offer with their guide every year. But just like the Orthodox Union has this really great guide that the whole country kind of turns to, um, you know, the OU, um, you, know, the, you know, the people who literally create the OU symbol right here, um, you know, that most of us depend. There are other groups that do it for the Sephardic world. And um, there are certain groups that now um, do certification for TEO in the United States. OU is one of them. It'll say OUP. Kitniot on it. And so that's how you know. It must say OUP Kitniot for it to be kosher for Passover and inclusive of Kitniot. And, um, and so um, that is the mark that we have. There is also the star KP. Um, we, um, and, um, and, and so it's, um, you know, it's the, um, the, the, you know, the star K, um, the, you know, the star kosher trying on um, the star kosher um, certification, you know, they have all of these different type of um, certifications that are specifically for Sephardic Jews who, and those who keep of the tradition of keep me, you can find it, but there's very few of these products that you'll find in this country um, because, um, you know, they still assume that most of this country is Ashkenazi. You'll find certain things that come in this time of year, such as Bamba and stuff like that, which, um, and uh, hopefully they have them this year, that I'll find some in kosher for Passover. 
and stuff like that. But that's the symbol. We do have a modern symbol. But traditionally, there's certain guides that you turn to. And the one, um, the best guide that there generally is out there is, um, is the, 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 um, the, the guide that is offered at kashru.com by um, the Jersey Shore Orthodox Rabbinate. The Jersey Shore Orthodox Rabbinate, um, in Jersey Shore, they actually have a really large Sephardic, tradi um, you know, Sephardic community of the Syrian tradition. And um, so for um, decades now, um, they've been doing traditionally what you do is, you know, the rabbis would, you know, type out a list of all the offerings that they knew in their area. And um, that's how this, this, this guide started was them typing out all of the stuff that they had supervised as kosher supervisors or that they had, you know, on kept correspondence with in order to give advice about what, um, you know, what type of uh, products to eat and that uh, stuff like that. And would give brand names. Now these days they give less brand names because they don't really get as much access um, to um, a lot of the products like they used to, um, you know, to the, the manufacturers don't give them the list of where their um, additives are derived from. So um, they don't give, you know, quite as many, um, you know, quite as many um, brand names, but they do give practical advice. Like, okay, what did they say here about beans? Beans. Uh, fresh may be used for all sephardim, and, um, and dried and processed ones may be used according to one's custom. They should be checked one time before place, like and kept out um, and kept and and uh, kept, but keep an eye out for an infestation, especially in black eyed peas. And that's important to know. Cereals, malt. Ah, that's a whole nother one. Why is there? Why why do Rice Krispies and Corn Flakes have comets in them? It's because of the malt. What is malt? Malt is what, what is created in the vats when they're, 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 they're processing the wheat and they're soaking it to soften you know, um, the grains to process it up and everything. They, they have this fermentation that separates from it, and that's called the malt. Well, they sift it off of it, and they add it into certain things for flavor, um, such as corn flakes and um, Rice Krispie treats. Milo, that's what you're getting within that, Ovaltine, um, those types of things. It adds a little bit of nutrients into it like a nutritional yeast does. And um, except this, unlike nutritional yeast, which is not comets, this is actual comets. And so that's kind of strange within that. But they offer us all kinds of, you know, really wonderful advice that we need to know. Like I was pointing this out last time, like eggplants, you know, in the Middle Eastern tradition, we eat a lot of eggplants. What, what's their advice? Eggplants, dried eggplants. These are, these are imported from Turkey. They are collected from different villages. The importer informed us and was verified by a rabbi, AKO, Association of, of Kashri Organizations in Turkey, that the local women scoop them out and hang them to dry on a string. And in the event that there is a rush to get them out, on, to get them dried out, wheat flour can be added to draw out the moisture. Understandably, we cannot recommend these for Passover. Japanese eggplant is a fine alternative. They are very long and slender and can be easily cut in half and scooped out. And that is a wonderful, you know, a, a, you know, real, you know, wonderful advice, you know, that, you know, they offer, you know, when it comes to these things. And so that's really important being that, you know, we are of these, you know, traditions, we, you know, keep eye out for certain things and are able to offer, you know, some expert, you know, advice to come to this. So um, the kosher guide for pastreet.com, the JSOR, a Passover 2020 um, bulletin. Um, I think it's really one of the best resources, you know, to still turn to in order to get advice about how to manage in, according to the Sephardic tradition. And um, I think they really, they really still are the experts when it comes to that. And um, one of the, um, you know, one of the other um, great resources is. Um, the Chicago Rabbinic Council. And um, the Chicago Rabbinic Council, like another you know, large metropolitan community, they're starting to keep in mind that um, you know, they have people of, um, you know, of all Jewish traditions, you know, not just Ashkenazi Jewish tradition, they just don't assume um, the Jewish tradition coming from that perspective. They include the Sephardic traditions as well. So what you'll notice within their um, within their guides is that um, they, 
as they give instructions for things, what they do is, is that in the, on their pages, they will offer in boxes information about what the tradition is according to um, the Sephardic tradition. What do, what are the rules according to the Shulchan Aruch that, that, that um, Sephardic Jews um, hold by? And, um, you know, what is our, our custom? And that's not to, that's not saying that um, Sephardic Jews are being lenient. No, they're giving you um, examples of where the rulings are of, um, of why we keep, you know, certain, um, you know, why we keep certain customs. And like, let me give you an example right here um, where it can differ from different communities. And it really, um, you, you know, it, 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 you, you know, you can, um, the Sephardic tradition, we don't freak out about as, as many things. Like, let me give you an example, sinks. Normally at this time of year, a lot of Ashkenazi Jews, what they're doing is that they're covering their entire kitchen, their drains, and everything with foil. Everything that you can is, is, is covered with foil. And, um, you know, my friends, when they're all, you know, young high school students, we would cover the, the yeshiva walls in all foil. And, um, you know, all the way up the walls and everything, and then hold the rave afterwards, after, Pas after Passover was over. All this foil there. Um, overkill, though. And we even knew it was, you know, a lot of people were going overkill on this. But the thing is, is that for you to not get in contact with, you know, um, with where hametz might be. And um, what happens is that it says right here, porcelain sinks cannot be kosher. They cannot be made kosher, you know, for the, 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 the holiday. You know, there are um, interesting, this past week's Torah portion that was about, about, things that can be made kosher and things that cannot be made, you know, kosher again. And, um, you know, um, um, there are certain things which you, which, which cannot be made completely kosher because they're porous, things such as earthenware. I'm not going to get up to show you my earthenware. We have some of our pots from Mexico here, but those things, they, what they get in them is they get little cracks. Um, you know, they get little cracks in it. And what happens is that the sourness of, of, of Kamets, of this growth grow, grows in through them. And so what happens is that we, you know, we, um, you know, you're not to, you know, case for these things, but porcelain, they consider it part of these, you know, um, these, these earthenware items. So you cannot kosher, you cannot make a kosher. What you do is you cover it. You completely cover it up throughout the entire holiday, your porcelain sink. And so you cover it with plastic and foil and all kinds of things. And uh, people like cut, you know, holes and plastic containers and set them in there and then put foil and all this stuff. Well, look at what it says for the Sephardic tradition. Rav Ovadia Yosef, Chazon Ovadia Pesach, 2003 edition, is that he ruled that porcelain sinks may be cashiered in the same way that stainless steel or Korean sinks are cashiered. He added that it's preferable to, under, to undergo the process three times of porcelain sinks. So what is that process? Um, this, this year they didn't, you know, they, they didn't spell it out, um, you know, quite so much. I think it goes in the lines before is what you do is um, you basically, you, you um, pour water, you pour boiling water over, um, you know, over it. And um, when it comes to porcelain sink, you need to pour from a tea kettle, boiling water over your porcelain counter after it's been entirely cleaned of any type of residue on it. And that's fine. That's enough. So it, it, it gives you, um, you, know, um, you know, the different types of rulings that there are between different traditions. Uh, you know, in the Ashkenazi tradition, microwaves become a problem. And, you know, you can't make it kosher for Passover. In the Sephardic tradition, we, we allow it. You, you just have to clean it completely. Unless it's been bubbled and warped from food burning into the plastic, um, which is a totally different case that that would make anything, you know, a transparent of taste and stuff like that. Understandable, normal halakha, but, you know, there's no reason why we can't just clean it out and be fine. We use, again, hot water. We put hot water in a bowl, put it in the microwave. We turn it on for about, for about 20, 30 minutes to let the steam evaporate all over the sides. Once all the sides are covered with steam, it's completely kosher. Um, within it. And, and so, you know, you can move on with doing that. So some practical advice of, um, you know, that comes through um, knowing because it's been our tradition. We've handed down this tradition of how to make it possible instead of just clamming up when we see something new and, and not knowing what to do. I say this because when, when, when I, I uh, 
when I came into the Orthodox Jewish world, um, you know, a lot of people used to ask me, what is your, you know, what is the, the, the custom of this? How, what is your guys' custom regarding this? So I didn't really understand quite so much why they were obsessed with that. And the reason, the reason for that is, is because, um, you know, they would explain to me, they're like, well, you know, a lot of things, you know, technically are allowed according to Jewish law. We just don't know how to process it correctly. Like, for instance, I mean, we could, you know, we can eat a buffalo, you know, I mean, it is kosher animal, but, you know, we don't know how to shuck it. We don't know how to, you know, slaughter it. I mean, it, it, I could, you know, I mean, it, um, do you know how? To, I mean, you come from a place where, you know, these animals are, are you know, um, are grown for food and blah, 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 blah. I mean, do you know how that's done? If you pass on the knowledge, then we can follow likewise. And so that's what I'm trying to do in, in the same manner for our Sephardic tradition, uh, wanting to pass on this Masora of tradition on onto you. And I say that is because the reason why a lot of Ashkenazi Jews do not keep the tradition of Kitniya is because they are, um, you know, they are not of the tradition of it. Um, and it, the, but the actual ruling is, is so that you do not, um, so that you do not um, um, show disrespect to the tradition of your forefathers. The reality, though, is that in America, a lot of us were deprived of our, uh, of, of our culture and our religion growing up. We, um, because of assimilation, many of us were deprived of our, of our Jewish identity, Mexican-American identity, all these things, you know, are, are, we were deprived of, 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 of our identity. We didn't grow up with it. And so many of us later on as, you know, teenagers, as adults, um, have decided that we are going to um, reclaim our tradition. And that creates a very unique circumstance in that, when we have people who are Bale Chuva, when they, they are returning to Judaism, they, they didn't come from um, being raised in the Jewish tradition. They are taking on the tradition from themselves. Um, you know, they, they, um, if, they, if their parents weren't observant, if they didn't have a tradition that was handed down to them, then they wouldn't be, dis they wouldn't be showing disrespect to the Ashkenazi tradition if an Ashkenazi Jew decides they're going to follow on Kitniyot. You know, they're, they, they are completely, you know, um, um, it's completely valid for them to choose that. Um, you know, there, there, is, there is no disrespect. As a matter of fact, it's a great mitzvah. And so um, that's one of the things I would encourage for people, those of you who are uh, taking up celebrating Passover, you didn't grow up with the Passover tradition, you do have the choice in order to choose. Um, you know, what your tradition is going to be. And that's very important because a lot of us, um, you know, it, it, part of our, um, the importance of, of our Jewish faith, I think of a lot of them, our generation and our authenticity um, really comes from us um, making our Judaism our own, not the, not the Judaism of our, of our parents or our grandparents. It's not showing disrespect to them. But 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 um but on um, taking on Judaism, taking on our traditions, our culture, our faith cultures as our own, standing in our own emuna, um, and and sending forth our for, forth our own path, and I think that's very beautiful. That a lot of us are um, and that's very necessary for some of us who maybe come from very complicated Jewish backgrounds, very complicated families. Um, I think it's a very inspiring thing that we can choose. Um, our tradition and our own emuna as we um, decide that we are going to, um, you know, um, um, you know, seek freedom from assimilation. And so that is really one of the things that, you know, I, I want people to be able to be able to embrace the tradition of Kitniyot. And um, hopefully I've been able to demystify some of this. It should also help with all this co COVID cleaning. Oh, yes, you know, it, it, it's, um, you, you know, right now, yeah, having to clean for the Passover holiday, plus having to clean for a, a, a plague. Who knew? Um, you know, it, I was really sad when I saw the runs on the market because I saw everyone buy up the rice and beans and the, the matzahs and everything. I was like, oh, my gosh, how are we going to have a Passover holiday? So that I, that I have matzah here, that I have food, that I have, you know, a connection in order to be able to keep the holiday with you, I'm, I'm just thrilled, you know, um, you know, we've never, not through Inquisitions, not through the show, not through the Holocaust, not through anything, did we stop doing this, we kept it to the extent that we could, 
and um, I'm, I'm glad that we're keeping the continuity of our Jewish tradition alive here. Um, but I want to thank all of you who, who um, joined me today um, for this workshop. If uh, anyone has any questions, uh, you know, regarding, you know, regarding Kashrut um, and you know, keeping it for the Sephardic tradition, if you need any advice on, on, on how to source any products during the Passover holiday, I am here to help. Um, but um, I uh, hope that you all have a kosher and a happy Passover holiday. That's actually the greeting, uh, that you have a kosher and a happy Pesach. And uh, um, that's how important it is. And, um, but it is important that we do, do go through this effort of, of checking everything to look for this comment, the symbol of pride in our lives. This, uh, you know, um, this hidden pride in our lives um, that, that, that we need to give up um, and that, that, like the Israelites, we need to, you know, eat our humble bread, our, our bread of affliction, and, um, but it'll taste so good because it'll be, it, it'll, be, it'll be the taste of freedom after putting all of this work into making a Passover holiday. And we feel like slaves to the labor of it all. Um, we emerge on the other end in order to be able to have a taste of freedom. And um, I think that's so beautiful. But um, yeah, do join us online. We're going to be having a streaming here. And, uh, um, you know, do let me know, you know, um, um, you know, if, you know, next time, if any of you want to, um, in the next few days, let me know that when we come together for Passover, if you want to do any readings, um, if you want to be included. Um, I would like to have people turn their cameras on on the other end so I can see some smiling faces and stuff like that. And, um, but yeah, um, I am really looking forward to being able to spend the, the, the um, yeah, the Passover of the Great Plague um, with you in spirit. Um, but I'm already starting to go stir crazy from missing you guys. So I can't wait until I'm able to welcome you guys back again for the holidays. And um, yeah, so um, what I'm going to do is I am going to, um, you know, chat with people in the background. So do go ahead and message me. But um, hag sameach, everyone. I uh, wish you a kosher and a happy Passover holiday. See you on Wednesday, guys. Be well.